Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Dick Gross for his third talk about the future of complex multiplication. Um, the uh, scheduled introducer, Samit Dasgupta, is not here at this JMM. And so um, by joint agreement, I do have the opportunity to present two short anecdotes about Dick that I had in mind um, to present two days ago when I first introduced him. Um, these are very short. Anecdote number one is that Dick is the first mathematician I can think of who actually served as a consultant to Hollywood um, where a movie was made featuring a prominent character who is a mathematician. The movie is called It's My Turn, featuring Jill Clayburgh. It was made in the mid-1970s, and Dick most notably instructed Jill how to prove the snake lemma for a course in graduate algebra and you can see this on YouTube very easily. Anecdote number two is uh, that Dick served as Dean of Harvard College for about five years, from 2003 to 2007, I think. And if you've seen the movie The Social Network, you see that Mark Zuckerberg is called in to see the dean, and the dean in question was actually Dick Gross. And if Dick has time at the end of his talk, he might actually explain how that encounter went. Okay. Thanks, Ken. Those were great introductions, and um, it went very well. It went very well. <laughs> Suffice it to say that he was not kicked out of Harvard College. He decided to uh, voluntarily uh, leave Harvard College. Suffice it to say, uh, we've gone through the theory of complex multiplication in, in uh, the first 250 years, and uh, I want in this lecture to give you an idea of uh, some new directions that have occurred in in the past 20 years, uh, I think it's a very vibrant field, uh, and I hope by the end of the talk you'll see uh, what I mean. So let's start with uh, the formula that I had mentioned yesterday that I proved with Don Zagier about the uh, height of this, uh, this point that was constructed from the modular curve and the modular parameterization of the elliptic curve in terms of the derivative of the L function of the elliptic curve at 1. So remember that the uh, this is the canonical height that was defined by Neron and Tate, the size of the point, and this is a non-zero number. So in particular, it told us the point had infinite order when the derivative was non-zero. Now, uh, this formula was guessed by Brian Birch, or a version of it was guessed by Brian Birch, and it was intended to study these points on the modular curves. Uh, so the, the initial object was the modular curves and the points and the elliptic curve, and the L function came in at the very end of the story to tell you whether the point had infinite order in various uh, of its eigenspaces. But the progress that's been made has kind of turned the thing around, and it starts instead with the L function and then comes up with objects in algebraic geometry later from a study of the L function. So... Let's start there. This L function of the elliptic curve over the imaginary quadratic field is analytically made out of two modular forms. First modular form is the modular form of weight 2, which Taylor and Wiles were able to associate to an elliptic curve over the rational numbers, the modularity. And the second modular form is much more classical. It comes from a modular form of weight 1, and that's a combination of uh, binary theta series, theta series that were studied uh, almost at the time of Gauss. And combining those makes an L function whose analytic behavior is very well understood, and that's what allows you to give you the analytic continuation of this L function uh, to the entire complex plane beyond the half plane of convergence of the Euler product and prove a functional equation for it. And this functional equation is, uh, it says that the values of the function at S are related to the values of the function at the point 2 minus s, like the Riemann zeta function uh, has a functional equation when s is related to 1 minus s. And in particular, the fixed point of this functional equation is the point where we're studying it, namely s equal 1, where s is equal to 2 minus s. And this functional equation that's obtained for this product of two modular forms has a sign in it. 
It, it tells you whether when you reflect from S to 2 minus S, you get a positive sign or a negative sign. In particular, it determines the parity of the order of vanishing of the function at the point S equal 1, whether it vanishes to even order or odd order. Now, the reason that we knew that this function vanished at S equal 1 in the case we were studying was whenever you can produce this point on the modular curve, you have to assume something about the primes dividing the uh, level of the modular form of weight 2 in the ring of integers of the imaginary quadratic field. You have to assume that they were split. Some people call this the Hegner hypothesis. And that assumption forces the sign of the functional equation of this L function to be minus 1. And in particular, it vanishes to odd order at the point S equal 1. And uh, its value is zero. That's why we were tempted to study the first derivative, because it vanished already. So we knew we were, we were really at the first possible leading term in the Taylor expansion. Well, that's what we did. We studied the first derivative. But it's also possible, without assuming that the primes dividing n split in the imaginary quadratic field, that the sign of the functional equation might be plus 1, in which case it would vanish to even order in the middle of the critical strip at s equal 1. And in that case, you might want to study the first non-obvious term, which is the value of the function at s equal 1, uh, the value at 1. And that had been studied at exactly the same time that Zaghi and I were working on the derivative by a young French mathematician, Jean-Luc Valsperger. And... Uh, he used completely different methods. We were using methods in algebraic geometry and analytic theory of Rankine series, and he was using representation theory and the theory of automorphic forms. And uh, this is a picture of Valsperger. His approach has turned out to be incredibly fruitful and suggested to me and to others a, a way of generalizing our methods to a, to a much larger context. So I should tell you how I learned about Valsperger's work, because it was so fortunate for me. Uh, it was at a conference in Durham in England, and uh, it was organized by Birch and Rankin, and Zagier had been scheduled to give a talk, and we had just come up with a proof of our identity, and so we got in touch with Birch and asked him if we could split Don's talk, and he could talk half of it, I could talk the other half, and he said fine, and we sketched out our two parts of the formula, and then at the end of our lecture, there was a little conference in the front of the room with Rankin and Birch and Sayre, and we were summoned up and asked if we would each give six hours more lectures on, on this on this thing. So we said, okay, we run, ran back to our room, started preparing lectures. And by the end of the conference, I was completely exhausted, completely exhausted. And the last day or the last afternoon of the last day was given to talks of 20 minutes by graduate students who were writing their theses, which I thought I could pretty conveniently skip. But one of my friends at the conference, Marie-France Vigneras, said that she had a particularly strong graduate student and that I should go to his lecture. And I said, no, 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 I'm just too tired. She said, no, 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 you must go to the lecture of Altsperger. So I did. And five minutes into his lecture, I realized not only was he studying exactly the same L functions we were, but in the case where the sign was plus one, but he had a terrific method for analyzing the situation. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. And uh, I should say that Valsperger has gone on to be one of the leading people in this generation of automorphic forms. I mean, since Langlands, there are only one or two people you could compare with him in the entire subject. He's been such a, a giant. All right, now, what Valsperger had observed is that the sign in the functional equation is a product of local signs. You have uh, these local signs of, oops, sorry, local signs of the representations, F and G, the automorphic forms, and then this is the quadratic character of the extension, uh, of the imaginary quadratic field evaluated at minus 1. The product of all of these is 1. But I've written it in this way because the, the um, you can show that for almost all primes, in particular the ones that don't divide the level n of the form of weight 2, these, uh, these local terms are plus 1. And when they're plus 1, that means you can ignore them in this infinite product, and so this infinite product is really a product over a finite number of terms. And there's an interpretation for that sign. Valsperger gave an interpretation for that sign in representation theoretic language. And he defines the finite set of the primes where this Local sign, which is plus or minus one, 
is not equal to plus one, it's minus one. And of course that means that this is finite, as I say, and it means that this sign is given by minus one to the number of elements in S. So Vosbergier was studying the case where S was even, and so the global sign was plus one. And in that case he observed, and this is a famous theorem of Hilbert, that if you have an even number of places of the rational numbers, there's a quaternion algebra, a form of the two by two matrices, unique up to isomorphism, defined over the rational numbers, which ramifies at the set S, where, namely where it locally becomes a division algebra, at all the other places it becomes a two by two matrix algebra. If the sign is minus one, and so that's the situation we were looking at, the cardinality of this set where the local signs are minus one is odd, and you can't find a quaternion algebra. And that's in some sense what makes Waldsperger's situation simpler than ours. Well, what does he do? He takes the sign, the global sign, to be plus one, and he takes the form of the group PGL2, the projective general linear group, which corresponds to the quaternion algebra, ramified at that uh, at even set of places. So that, that that's a group which is the multiplicative group of the quaternion algebra modulo scalars. If the quaternion algebra were two by two matrices, that would be PGL2. All right. And he gives a formula for the value of this Rankin L series at one as an integral over a torus in this group corresponding to the imaginary quadratic field of a function in the representation corresponding to F, that's phi, times the character of the torus, which corresponds to the modular form G. So that's an integral over a compact group, so it's a it's well-convergent integral, but you don't know whether the integral is zero. It's somehow an average value, which could be zero or not. And as I say, this is a function on this form of the quaternion algebra, modulo the rational points, and you get a character of the torus. All right. Now, he proves, and his formula, it's very explicit, shows that the value of this Rankin L function is non-zero if and only if some one of these period elements for some function in this representation associated to the modular form F is non-zero. And when these periods are non-zero, they define a map from an infinite dimensional representation of uh, the torus. So you restrict this representation pi from G to T, you tensor it with chi, that gives you a representation of the torus, and taking these values and integrating them gives you a homomorphism, an equivariant homomorphism to the trivial representation. So Waldsperger's interpretation of this is that when the L function is non-zero. First of all, this homomorphism space to the trivial representation is non-zero, and this integral gives a non-zero element in it. So, in, in his light, the non-vanishing of this value at one is related to a restriction problem in representation theory from this form of PGL2 to a maximal torus. Now, the group this form of PGL2 is a special orthogonal group of an orthogonal space in three variables. And the orthogonal space is the elements of trace zero in the quaternion algebra, and the quadratic form is the norm form. And the subgroup, this torus inside of the form of PGL2, fixes a, a non-isotropic vector in this three-dimensional orthogonal space and is the special orthogonal group of the orthogonal complement, which is a two-dimensional space. So in this light, Valsperger's work can be viewed as using L functions and epsilon factors to study the restriction of local representations and also automorphic or modular representations from the group SO2 to the SO3 to the group SO2. And then I had a wonderful student, Dependra Prasad, who extended these results of Valsperger and studied the restriction of local representations from the group SO4 to the group SO3 in his PhD thesis. Well, once he had done that, it was natural to study restriction from SON to SON minus one, and also when we understood it from the unitary group to UN minus one. And with Dependra Prasad and, and Wittek Gan, I made a sequence of conjectures generalizing Valsperger's work 
to study these restriction problems. And here's a picture of, of Prasad on the left and Gan on the right. WeTech just won the Presidential Medal of Science in Singapore, and, and Dependra was the leader of the Tata Institute in Mumbai and is now the chair of the, of the Council on Developing Countries for the IMU. And I should say that the local conjectures, which we viewed as completely outrageous, were, were settled absolutely by work of phenomenal work of, of Waldsperger and his student, uh, Bizarre Plessis. And the global conjectures, suffice it to say, are the subject of a lot of research. We heard about them in this special session here. They've been refined to give an exact value for the L function in terms of these restriction problems by, uh, Atsushi Ishino and Tamutsa Keita. Okay, so that's one direction the thing has gone. Uh, taking Valsperger's results, thinking of them as restriction problems from SO3 to SO2, and generalizing to restriction problems on represents, representations of, of, uh, of uh, larger groups. I should say that if you take the local restriction problem for these representations in the real case, over the real numbers, and you take the groups which are compact, the, the unitary compact unitary groups and compact orthogonal groups, then our predictions for the restriction problem are exactly the classical branching formulas uh, that are famous in representation theory. All right, so that was when the sign was plus one, but we had done the case where the sign was minus one. So this set of local epsilon factors which were minus one was odd, and the L function had to vanish. Well, then it's natural to study the derivative. In the case we did, it turned out in retrospect that the only place where the sign was minus one was infinity. But uh, we could generalize this and take the case where it's an odd set, which contains the infinite place, but could be larger. And then there turned out to be a similar theory of special points, not on modular curves, but on curves that had been defined by Shimura. So, for example, we just take an indefinite quaternion algebra, and we have it ramify at an even set of places where we take infinity out of the set S. Remember, we have an odd set that contains the infinite place, so removing it, we get an even set. And you can find a quaternion algebra over the rationals. It's indefinite, which ramifies at that set. And you take an order in there, something like a, a, a subring, which is of rank 4 over the integers, which has reduced discriminant N the N of the modular form F. And then the units of norm 1 in that order form a discrete subgroup of SL2R because the quaternion algebra is unramified at infinity, and that acts on the upper half plane. And Shimura had proved that if you took the quotient of the upper half plane by this arithmetic group, first of all, it's compact because it's an actual quaternion algebra and not a matrix algebra, and secondly, that it has a model as an algebraic curve over the rationals, just as Kronecker had proved that the classical modular form, the quotient of the upper half plane by gamma zero of n, had a canonical model over the rational numbers. And every embedding that you make of your imaginary quadratic ring into this quaternion order gives a special point on this curve, and that point on the canonical model is rational over the Hilbert class field. That's Shimura's reciprocity law. The modular form not only gives a map from the modular curve x0 of n to an elliptic curve, but it also gives a map from the Shimura curve to the elliptic curve. And we can define our point on the elliptic curve over an imaginary quadratic field in exactly the same way. We take the image of the point on the modular curve to the elliptic curve via this map, and then we take the sum over the Galois group of the Hilbert class field over k, and trace it down using the addition law on the elliptic curve to get a point over k, exactly as we did in the previous case. And Shou Zhang and his uh, students at the time, Xin Ji Wan and Wei Zhang, proved the formula relating the first derivative of this Rankin L series to the height of this point. And notice how how interesting it is. The, you start if you started with the L series, the local signs in its functional equation tell you which Shimura curve to go to, namely which quaternion algebra to use to make a point such that you get um, you get some point on this elliptic curve. 
in our case, it didn't work in many cases. We needed all the primes dividing end to split. But if they didn't, then you'd get a Shimura curve. And they also found a limit formula which is much deeper for the first derivatives of these L functions over totally real fields. Again, you use the L function to define a set S, and in their situation, S has to contain all the places uh, dividing infinity. There's a picture of Shou on the uh, on the left and Xin Yi on the right, and I didn't include a picture of Wei here because he'll appear in a later slide. Uh, I should say that after their work, I began to think of these Shimura curves as not being associated to quaternion algebras at all, but being associated to an odd set of places containing all the infinite places. Uh, that's uh, really what they were working with. And the reason is this, that to make a Shimura curve over a totally real field, you have to have a fixed place in infinity. Well, if you have a fixed place in infinity, and you subtract that from your set of odd places, you now have an even set of places, which do not include that place in infinity, and you can make a Shimura curve in the way that I defined it over Q. But that only tells you what the curve looks like at that real completion of the totally real field. And if you want to know what the curve looks like at another real completion of the totally real field, you have to work with a different quaternion algebra where you switch those two real places. So what's really canonical is just the odd set of places, and each time you want to uniformize the curve, you remove one of those places and use the quaternion algebra ramified at what's left. Okay, now we come to the very interesting situation where a world is not understood, but it's just absolutely fascinating when this odd set of places does not contain the infinite place. Let's go back to the rational numbers. We we, we get an L function where maybe at infinity, the sign is, is plus one. So our odd set of places. Now then, we don't know what to do. We can't make a Shimura curve or anything. The simplest case where that would occur was when your modular form ha was associated to an elliptic curve of prime conductor P, and the modular form G came from a real quadratic field of discriminant D where the prime was inert then you would find you got an odd set of places which contained only the prime P, but not the prime infinity. Well, what about, what happens then? The, the value vanishes, the global sign of the functional equation is, is minus one. What can we say about the derivative? So Henri Darmon and his many collaborators have proposed the existence of some points defined over the Hilbert class field of this real quadratic field, associated to each of the classes of discriminant D, and whose height should be related to this first derivative. Why not? I mean, that's what worked in the imaginary quadratic case. But there we have the theory of complex multiplication to construct the points. Now, they modeled these conjectures after some conjectures of Harold Stark, who had tried to generalize the theory of elliptic units as developed by Kronecker by predicting the existence of units in abelian extensions of real quadratic fields whose logarithms were related to the first derivatives of art in L series at S equals zero. So Stark's conjecture were well established, and Henri and his collaborators said, well, why don't we try the same thing for elliptic curves? We have a perfectly nice L function. Its derivative at one would usually not be zero. Maybe we can predict the existence of special points whose heights are exactly the derivatives of those L functions. And they construct points, but not over the imaginary quadratic field, but over its p-adic completion. And the p-adic logarithms of those points, not the heights, appear in the first derivatives of p-adic L functions. So that's an analytic theory that doesn't play, take place over the complex numbers, but over the p-adics. And the conjecture, which would be a theory of real multiplication if it existed, was that this point should be rational over the Hilbert class field. They should all be conjugate under the Galois group, and their sum should be defined over the real quadratic field. And in that case, one would have the following formula for the derivative that the derivative of the Rankin L series, which is the derivative of the L series of the elliptic curve over the real quadratic field, should be the height of this point that they construct times 
this period integral, which is a little bit more complicated than the complex case. And they have enormous experimental evidence for this. So the points exist, but the problem is, just as the original Hegner points were constructed in the complex numbers, these points are constructed on the points of the elliptic curve over the p-adic numbers. And we don't have yet a theory to prove that they're algebraic. However, the evidence that this is true is overwhelming, just as the evidence for Stark's conjecture. So that's a big challenge for us in the future. And I should say that Samit Das Gupta had the great idea of replacing this cusp form, F, by an Eisenstein series to construct units in abelian extensions of this real quadratic field, the sort of thing Stark wanted to do. He constructs them piatically. And he used these units to establish an old conjecture on piatic L functions of Artin type at S equals zero, so a, a piatic Stark conjecture. Uh, which had been around for a long time. It's really beautiful work. So here are pictures of Henri and Samet, who unfortunately couldn't make it to the meeting, but I want to thank them both because they organized the special session that I was somehow responsible for organizing. So thank you again. That special session was incredible. Okay, let's go on. So another direction of generalization is that elliptic curves with complex multiplication have been generalized for some time to abelian varieties with complex multiplication. So these are a varieties of dimension, higher dimension over the complex numbers, dimension G, and they have a group structure, and the, the endomorphisms of this group structure turns out to be a commutative ring of rank 2G over the integers. So elliptic curves with complex multiplication, G is equal to 1, and the endomorphism ring, this ring in the imaginary quadratic field, is uh, of degree 2. So these abelian varieties with complex multiplication were studied in the 1950s by Shimura and Yutaka Tanayama, and they proved all the theorems that were known for elliptic curves with complex multiplication, namely that their moduli, that the fields of definition, were algebraic number fields. That was like the J invariant turned out to be algebraic, and that their L functions over those number fields could always be written as a product of Hecke L series. That was the result of Doering's generalizing V. So that was fantastic work. And But Shermura went much further, and he used this theory of complex multiplication of abelian varieties to study the uh, quotients of bounded symmetric domains by arithmetic subgroups of the real group of automorphisms. And those are fascinating varieties over the complex numbers that had been known for some time, but Shimura was able to prove that they had canonical models over number fields where the points of complex multiplication on them had prescribed values. So this was a huge advance. It, it, it generalized the theory of modular curves to modular varieties of higher dimension. And these varieties are now called Shimura varieties, and they're the focus of a, an enormous amount of study uh, in number theory, not that we've exhausted everything about the modular curves, but uh, these higher dimensional varieties are, are useful in, uh, for example, establishing various correspondences predicted by Langlands. Now, Hegner points, uh, these special points, they're divisors on the modular curves because they have co-dimension one. And Shimura varieties don't always have divisors. In fact, they're very hard to find Shimura varieties that have divisors that are themselves Shimura varieties. But in the two cases where the real groups are uh, the orthogonal group of signature N2 or a unitary group of signature N1, you can have a collection of distinguished divisors on these varieties, which are themselves Shimura varieties. And they come from subgroups of the group G. So uh, the subgroups are SON minus 1, 2, and UN minus 1, 1. And if you take uh, N equal 1 in both of these examples, you get the modular curves, and these sub-varieties come from compact groups, and they give you the Hegner points. Well, Steve Kudla and Michael Rappaport and many, many of their collaborators have studied these divisors in the way that we studied Hegner points and computed the intersection pairings of these divisors against each other and compared them to derivatives, not of L functions yet, but in some cases L functions, but in general, uh, Eisenstein series for the symplectic group at S equals zero. Uh, this is a fantastic program initiated by Kudla, and then Rappaport became involved in, in some of the algebraic geometric aspects of it. And the values of these Eisenstein series, before you took their derivatives, are uh, 
given by a sum of theta series. That's called the ziegel weil formula. It's a formula, a very famous formula in the theory of modular forms. But uh, they constructed these Eisenstein series in a way that they knew the value was zero. And so by computing their derivative, they were kind of working out an, a, a program which Kula called an arithmetic theta correspondence, something which is generalizes the classical theta correspondence relating theta functions in Eisenstein series. Well, I can't go, this is, this is worth three lectures in itself, but um, I have included at least pictures that Steve Kudlan left Michael Rappaport uh, on the right. And that's a very, it, it's a very uh, active program. There, there must be now 50 people working in this program, uh, all, all coming up with results along the line that Kudla predicted. And finally, I want to end with this because I find this particularly exciting. It's a completely different direction. Uh, Wei Zhang and, and Ji Wei Yun have found a generalization which in, encodes both the limit formula Zagi and I did and the period formula of Waldsperger in, in, in one fell swoop. And they study the case where they replace the base field of the rational numbers where we did elliptic curves and modular forms by a function field uh, of a curve over a finite field. And say the finite field has cardinality Q. Now, in that case, these L functions of an elliptic curve are much, much simpler. They're again given by an infinite Euler product over the places of this function field. But since all the places of a function field have the same residual characteristic, there can be a lot of cancellation in these infinite Euler products, which doesn't happen over the rational numbers. And in fact, if the J invariant doesn't lie in the finite field, then it turns out that this infinite product just defines a polynomial in Q to the minus S with integer coefficients. So it's a much simpler L function to analyze. For example, its analytic continuation is not difficult to prove. And the degree of that polynomial depends only on the genus of the base curve and the conductor of the elliptic curve, which is a divisor on the base curve. So here's my favorite example. Uh, take this uh, curve that was studied by Legendre in characteristic zero, but study it over the field of Q elements where Q is odd. That defines an elliptic curve. Y squared is X times X minus 1 times X minus T, and it's defined over polynomials over uh, the field of Q elements in the variable T. So the base curve is a, is a genus zero. It has bad reduction only at the, at the places zero, one, and infinity, that's when t is equal to zero or one or infinity, you get a curve with bad reduction. You compute the conductor has degree four, and that turns out that force the L function to be a polynomial of degree zero in Q to the minus S. So the L function is identically one. So that was easy. That sort of thing doesn't happen in the rational numbers, unfortunately. I should say that there's a Birch and Swinnert and Dyer conjecture for these curves too. And you might think, oh, it must be very simple in this case. Well, it predicts the rank is zero and that the leading term is one, right? Well, yes, the rank of this curve is zero, but the terms that go into the Birch and Swinnert and Dyer conjecture for this curve are not one. For example, you have the order of the torsion subgroup. This has a torsion subgroup of order four, of type two, two. So what happens is there are a lot of finite groups that come into the conjecture, and when you take their quotient, you get one. It's a, it seems like a miracle. All right. Well, Michael Artman and John Tate exploited the fact that the L functions of elliptic curves over function fields were much simpler than they were over number fields. And they were able to prove in one direction of Birch and Swinnert and Dyer, remember the order of vanishing is supposed to equal to the rank, they showed that the order of vanishing was at least the rank. Namely, if you had a point of infinite order, the L function vanished. If you had two independent points of infinite order, the derivative vanished. And the whole conjecture of Birch and Swinnert and Dyer for the leading term and everything reduces to the first part, that the order at s equal 1 is equal to the rank. They also proved you could prove the entire conjecture of Birch and Swinnert and Dyer if you could just prove that the tate shafarevich group was finite at a single prime L. In particular, it should be trivial at almost all primes L because it's supposed to be a finite group. If you could prove finiteness at one prime L, that implied the entire conjecture. So it's clear that in this case we know a lot more about elliptic curves than we do over the rationals. But what Wei and, and Ji Wei did was completely new on this. And they did study the following situation, which is analogous to what we and Waldsperger had. They took a quadratic extension of their function field. 
And that, in the algebraic geometry world, corresponds to a double cover of the curve, if you keep the finite field the same, an irreducible double cover. And they found a formula for the L function over this quadratic extension. And not just the leading term at S equal 1. They found a formula for every term in the Taylor expansion, including those that were zero, uh, in terms of intersection theory. This was completely unexpected. We had almost no examples in number theory of people studying L functions where there was anything known about the next term in a Taylor expansion when one term was zero. The only case I knew of was uh, uh, the proof of the chalice selberg formula. But in this case, they found every term in terms of intersection theory. And the intersection take, theory takes place on beautiful geometric objects. They're stacks, they're not, and, and they're, they're, they're absolutely wild objects, which Drinfeld had introduced in his study of the Langlands conjecture, in his proof that the L functions of elliptic curves were modular. Uh, and they, these, these, these stacks Drinfeld called Stuka, which I think in, in Russian translates to something like stuff. And, uh, they classify vector bundles of rank two on the curve, which have some additional structure. And inside of these, uh, geometric stacks, you have a cycle which corresponds to those vector bundles of rank two on C with this additional structure that are pushed forward from line bundles on the double cover D. So that's very similar, if you think about it, to the, the, the consideration of Hegner points. You, you consider the divisor on the moduli space of elliptic curves corresponding to those elliptic curves which have complex multiplication by a quadratic extension. So that's the analog for these vector bundles of rank 2. And uh, the cycles that they intersect, as I say, are these moduli of vector bundles from the double cover. And I've included a picture of way here and Jiwei here, and uh, Jiwei gave a very illuminating talk at this meeting as to explain why it wasn't unreasonable to expect in the function field case that once you had a formula for the leading term in the Taylor development, you'd get a formula for all the others. So that's a, that's a really exciting recent development. So I hope uh, this gives you some idea of all the exciting work that's going on in the subject of complex multiplication today. And I want to thank you all for coming to all three talks. Uh, very much appreciated. I'm going to send the slides of these talks to um, people at the AMS so they can put them up on the AMS website if you want to consult them. So if you found any errors in my slides, please let me know right away. Thanks very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. I, I'm not, uh, this field. I just wonder if you could elaborate on what it means when you say enormous computational evidence. Well, uh, so what you can do is the following. Uh, and this was initiated by Stark and Darmon and his, his collaborators have done a great deal in this direction. Suppose you expect that the derivative of the L function is uh, the height of a point, or in Stark's case, the logarithm of a unit. Now you can compute these L functions. They're very computable on the machine to 20 decimal places, or in Darmon's case, to 20 piatic places. And then he has a piatic construction of a point, and he computes the height of that point to 20 piatic decimal places. And if they agree with each other to 20 places, you start to think maybe they're equal. That proves absolutely nothing. <laughs> Um, and I should say that that was a big frustration, the big frustration we had early in the time of Birch and Swinnerton Dyer. So Dorian Goldfeld, when I was a graduate student, Dorian Goldfeld, who was an instructor at MIT, proved that if we could find a single L function of an elliptic curve that vanished to order three, he could resolve this class number problem of Gauss, not just for class number one, but for all the class numbers. And we were like, well, that's easy. You just take an elliptic curve of rank three and you look at its L function and Birchard's winner and Dyer predicts that it vanishes to order three. And indeed, you could go compute the value and the first derivative and the second derivative of the L function on the computer. And every time we did it, we got 0.00000000, 20 zeros, 30 zeros, 40 zeros, 50 zeros. So there was no question that it vanished to order three. But that proves absolutely nothing because the next digit might have been a one. 
And it, it came to me when I was doing these, when we were banging our heads against the wall in this way, that these conjectures, which look like they're conjectures about the analytic behavior of L functions, like an L function should vanish to order 7 at this point, can never be an answer by analysis. What analysis can show you, and all the techniques of complex analysis can show you, is that if you take a very small circle around that point and compute the number of zeros inside of that circle, it's 7. But you never know whether they're right there or in a very tiny neighborhood. And so somehow to really attack these things, you have to find formulae for them. You can't just compute them analytically. And that's what I mean by the analytic evidence. It's all these, their computer calculations, their compatibilities with other conjectures, etc. But it all hangs together in a very tight way. But, uh, but it doesn't constitute a mathematical proof any more than checking something for the first 100 cases uh, uh, checks it forever. Other questions? That was really good. Thanks for letting me explain that. Okay. Well, thank you all very much.